University let me know that this is not just pink, but it was actually uh, originally the color of our football team. So because you know my investment in football, uh, I'm wearing this. Uh, and speaking of sports, I don't know if Mark Winder is here. Uh, I introduced him uh, uh, when he spoke as a triple threat. And I only uh, months later learned that that was also a sports term. I had no idea. So uh, um, tonight we have uh, someone who sort of occupies four roles. So I guess that's a, that's a home run. Uh, Pipo Trora is an architect. Uh, a teacher, he's a senior curator uh, at Maxi, and, uh, and a writer. So he covers uh, our field in great depth. I see him laughing, that's a good sign. Uh, and I promised him to keep this blessedly long yeah. so that he'll blanch yeah, midway through. Um, Pipo's curated and presented at the Maxi in Rome. Uh, and also at the Lazzi degli Anziani in Ancona. His publications include books on Ludvico Baroni, uh, Richard Meyer, and uh, New Italian Architecture, Italian Landscapes Between Architecture and Photography, and Museums, Next Generation, uh, which was published in 2006 by Electa. Now, I've known Pipo since the mid-80s, and uh, I know him via Columbus which seems oddly appropriate, not this Vespucci. Um, but not Christopher Columbus either. It was Columbus, Ohio, when we both taught as uh, young faculty. This is before either he or I uh, were curators or thought about um, what curating might be like in architecture. When I studied in, uh, in Rome, soon after we met, <laughs> I also, uh, I also used, uh, was able to use his parents' house in the Domus Aurea, which is, uh, you know, in the Calapio. This is uh, Nero's palace, which used to extend out to the Palatine. And so this has views of the Colosseum. And it was wonderful as a, as a young architect and, and uh, researcher to have this, have this place. So in some ways, I associate my history with Italy not only with Syracuse and Florence, but certainly in Rome uh, with Pipo. Uh, there were Christmases in Ancona, uh, where I, being the only uh, non-native speaker, tested the true limits of my capability with Italian. And luckily, Pipo's daughter, Vittoria, at that time was about four. So our vocabularies were about on par. So I had someone to talk to throughout the evening. But there's a kind of great circularity here, because uh, Victoria is now of the age where she can travel on her own to the United States. And uh, I saw her last in New York at the opening of uh, PS1, uh, one of Barry Bergdahl's uh, projects at MoMA. And now to have Barry Bergdahl and we'll see the exhibition that he had done, the Massey had done with students downstairs, the Marcel Breuer show. Uh, to have him here in the same room with Pipo, who as a curator is now going to be in partnership <coughs> doing uh, a, a kind of PS1 projects both at Maxi and uh, with uh, MoMA. It's a kind of wonderful coincidence of, of programming. Pipo is also the source of the best Quito Misto in uh, Italy, the best burrata, the best uh, swordfish carpaccio, and introduced me to Inotecas, my uh, Italian tapas alternative. And whether we were at the Aquario Romano or at the Venice Biennale, we also had great conversations about the frustration of young Italians, young Italian architects, with both the kind of weight of the old academy, the difficulty of younger theorists and writers to kind of break out of that mold, and also for young Italian architects to define their own present moment in Italian culture. So both looking at the legacy of Italian architecture in walks through the city and thinking about what might have happened, what could be the difficulty of building in a country like Italy. But the city was always close to his heart and is in his work now as a curator. 
and he's quoted as saying in getting the, uh, the position at Maxi that this was important because Maxi presented a platform for open discussion within the city, the nation, the world, and because architecture is a, in a particularly critical phase of its history, and institutions like Maxi can and must help it rethink both its present and its future. Tonight, uh, Hippo will talk to us about perhaps what is an end of architecture or without architecture. I look forward to hearing about this current work and what the future brings. Hippo. Good evening. Does it work? Okay. Um, you can go away with this. So this is uh, an impossible lecture. Uh, when, when with Mark, it's, it's, it's years we're trying to organize this. This time we were, I was finally happy to, to come here and to... I'm sorry. Yeah, presentation. So I was finally we could find a way to, to take me here. So I thank <coughs> you. I thank Alexandra and everybody else and Amy and uh, the others who were bringing me around today. And, and I saw a beautiful school, a beautiful atmosphere, a beautiful set of people working happily around what I, what I can already see as a project, I mean, as an idea. So I'm very, I'm really very happy also because Mark is a real old friend, a dear friend, an intelligent friend, and a challenging friend. So I think this is a good thing to be able to be here together and to, to do this. But the point is that what, what do you want to talk about? And in my life, I've been giving talk about basically everything, including uh, rock and roll or whatever, football, in, uh, or maybe Italian football, soccer. But Mark, everybody was focused on the fact that I'm doing this book. This book is for me interesting because uh, it comes out with what I've been thinking in the last years. But the book is a polemical book. It's a, it's a, a book against a number of real and hypothetical enemies the uh, architecture has in Italy. So it took me a while to me to understand how I could translate it into a lecture which could be uh, useful, understandable, of a venue for, for students and for uh, a general audience. Let's see if it works. It may not, but I do my best. Um, the book, the idea for this book I did, which is coming out with a general uh, publisher, <coughs> with, not with uh, an architectural publisher, so it is meant to be uh, open to to, gener to a general audience came to me came to my mind after you know already a few years of observation of the complicated condition of Italian architecture after uh, the Italophilie of the of the 70s or uh, 60s and 70s uh, our supposedly a Germany it came to me exactly in a show you, you know they do these beautiful architecture exhibitions in the Basilica Palladiana in Vicenza, so every architect is invited to do a, a project for the installation and, and exhibit his own work. And this was about, uh, I think, eight, seven, eight years ago, and, and Stephen Hall was invited. And Stephen Hall made a very simple exhibit, but then, uh, then he built a little building, uh, experimental, uh, sexy building, to be uh, placed into the Basilica. The, the exhibition was a big success, but the funny thing was this guy came in the end of a, 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 a tycoon of the event, typical Veneto tycoon, and he proposed even you know, to buy the building and uh, said, what do you want to do with it? And he said, I'm going to place it in my garden. So that was great. The idea of having modern art, contemporary architecture as a fountain or as a set of uh, Cinderella and, and work in the garden. So this idea of architecture not as a real life part of our society, but as a pure decoration you can have some time provoking me some nervous feelings and the idea of started to uh, look at this with a more 
a cold <laughs> and, and reactive eye. And then, I mean, I've, I've been moving back and forth, I've been going back and forth across the ocean many times in this year since the, uh, the Eisenman times in, in Ohio. And, and, and I, so I learned how to look at my landscape from away, which is a very good thing to try to understand what things are really are, or to make your own idea what, uh, what things are. And what, and I said, what, is, what is Italy? What is Italy for the other, for the rest of the world? What is the architecture in Italy for people who look at it from Europe, from US, from China, I don't know what. And I, and I think it's about three things. Now, one is history. This is the beautiful 16th century uh, piazza in Ascoli Piceno, the place where my school is, the city where my school and my students are, which is a great parasite project from the 16th century with all these uh, houses coming on to create the piazza. Uh, then Italy is an immense land of sprawl today. No? It's, it's a country that has been completely uh, changed and built in the last 40 years. So this is the typical image of our landscape today. It's basically all the flat land is, is like this, whereas the hills, the mountains still keep. And then it's Renzo Piano, that is it. I think the Italy is made of these three ingredients. History, uh, bad uh, professional architecture, and, and Renzo Piano. So can, can it be like that? I mean, so I started wondering, how, how, what, 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 what could we do? How could we reflect on this? And, and I started discussing also with my friends, so uh, with Francesco Benelli, which Berry, who Berry knows very well, and, 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 and Nini De Michelis, we thought we should do this symposium in, in, in New York and in Rome, which should be called, where the hell is Italy, no? Because we, nobody knows where is Italy in architecture today. But then we, we lose too much time speaking and talking to each other. Maybe we say things to too many people. So while I was uh, wasting my time curating the maxi and doing other things, this symposium came out somewhere else. But the funny thing was it was organized by the Swiss Institute, by Swiss scholars, and it was uh, spoken in English in Rome last year. I went to the symposium because they invited me, I was, and I was nervous again a little bit. But then when I found out that the, the theory they had is that Italian architecture legacy is only living in the uh, in, in the Aldorossi and Giorgio Grassi legacy, which has been de deposited, I would say, left into the Swiss architects, and that the real heirs of Aldorossi are Herzog and de Veron. I said, to them, oh, please, and I left for the second day of the symposium. So I said, okay, we cannot do the symposium now. Let's write this book. So I set myself down. And, inv and invested, basically, a couple of Augusts and, and, and sometime during the year to, to write the book, which is going to be out in May. A precedent, I mean, a previous experience for this is an interesting book uh, edited by the, and published by the CIVA, the Center for Architecture in Bruxelles, where they invited 26 critics from the 26 European countries to give, uh, to give a picture of the national uh, solution, and, and, and they asked me for, I mean, I was selected for, for one of these articles, and I had some, something to begin with. Uh, so I say, let, let's see what happens. Let's try to describe the situation to an international audience. And when I started to look at uh, I had this other terrible impression. And Lola Falana is a, is a TV star who was, I think, interesting, not even famous in America in the 60s. But when she started to decline, when nobody was uh, starting to hire her uh, anymore in America, she, of course, moved to Italy and became a superstar in Italy. So Lola Falana for me, was a metaphor of what's uh, happening to architecture, because I started to look. And I found out that, you know, uh, everybody is working in Italy. Every superstar is working in Italy. Every <coughs> Super superstar, medium superstar, star, uh, good architect, international architect is working with it. And, and you also have Italian uh, clients, you know, important Italian clients hiring uh, super architects, building uh, for them abroad, not only in Italy, but in New York, uh, and uh, call us for Prada, 
uh, so the beautiful transformer that Prada again permission to run coolest. The Herzog and Emeron fantastic uh, building in, in in Tokyo. So there are Italian clients who uh, ask for beautiful buildings from important architects around the world. Then there are uh, international art, the international architects they work in Italy a lot. You know, the the four uh, three out of the four contemporary buildings you can see in Rome have been built by Richard Meyer and Zaha Hadid. Uh, and Renzo Piano has done the fourth. Uh, this is you know, the, the, the church by Richard Meyer, quite an interesting building actually. Uh, and the Arab Patch is a less interesting building. Uh, this is the, um, the new macro, uh, 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 munici a municipal museum. A, a, a city museum which has been open more or less at the same time of the Maxi uh, with a project by Odile Depp. Uh, the Bocconi uh, headquarters in Milan is a project by the Grafton Architects. Uh, Santiago Calatrao, of course, is everywhere. This is a bridge on the highway in uh, Reggio Emilia, and this is this bridge, of course, in, in Venezia. This is, oh, this is a, a kind of a heavy tribunal by courthouse by the Chipperfield in, uh, in Salerno. Chipperfield is also building, as most of you know, a cemetery in Venice. Uh, even Anish Kapoor is building a building in Italy. No? This is a, a, a subway station in, in Napoli by the, the Indian, Anglo-Indian artist. Alvaro Siza uh, did the restoration, did hardly anything in the restoration of the Madre in Napoli. Peter Eisenman is building a, 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 a train station in Pompeii right next to these uh, ruins which are, we tend to fall down lately. You know? So it's an interesting, well, this is my new house, a beautiful building, I must say, uh, in, the, in the photo by Eva Ban, who's here. And, and also the stations, uh, this is the Zaha project for, who won the competition for the, uh, uh, fast train in Napoli. Uh, this is the one Isozaki won in, in Bologna for, again for the new station. This is a terrible project by Norman Foster for Florence, <laughs> who again won the competition for the new station. And this is Santiago Calatrava new station again in, in Reggio Emilia for the same fast track. So they, they did about, uh, again, this is Arep project for the station in Torino, and again, five of the big competitions for the new first train station were, uh, were won by, by international architects. It's interesting to say that uh, none of this is really under construction now, with, with a lot of money invested in it. Only the Caratrava one, which was not assigned by a competition, which was, it was a direct uh, commission. Uh, why do I think of Lala Falana? I started to think of Lala Falana when, when I saw the. Oh. Revenge. Okay, it's the same. I think of Lala Falana when I, when I saw the, 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 the three skyscrapers by Zaha, Libeskin, and Izozaki for the Milano Expo. Then this guy, the developer, went to Berlusconi and said to him, Do not worry, I will straighten them. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so there's always this funny relationship between architecture and society, which is, which is strange. Uh, Oscar Niemeyer. I mean, it, it, I, the funny thing is, I wrote. I must confess, I wrote his obituary last July because he was in a hospital. It was very bad. So this newspaper calls me and said, "People, please." We need an obituary for uh, Oscar Niemeyer. So uh, the day after I uh, wrote it, and of course he recovered and he's still around. And he comes to it little over this new building, which is an auditorium in the Costiera Amalfitana. Uh, then there is the Renzo Piano effect. Now I don't know if you've seen this beautiful sacrilegio show by Vetsoli at the Gotusian in, in New York. Renzo Piano for us is like Mother Mary. We cannot even discuss him. <laughs> uh, and then I was, it was painful for me yesterday to go to Boston and see the curtain, the center ran, attacked brutally. And that's another problem, you, that's the thing you, somebody, we have, to, we have to study this. This is the second attack by 
Lorenzo Piano to Corbu because already tried to build a hotel at the base of the Ramsham. And now, so there must be a problem there. Anyway, the Renzo Piano effect is that nearly only Renzo Piano can build in Italy with the same standards that we find in the international work. But not even Renzo Piano uh, sometimes can make it. You know, this is the skyscraper designed for Torino that, of course, the city is ready to reject and to refuse. And, and if you go, and, and one of the things that come with the Maxi, if you go next door, a hundred meters, a few yards, there's the auditorium by Renzo Piano, and it looks poor when you're confronted with building. It's very interesting. Then there is Fuxas, of course. You know, Renzo Piano is the only real Italian star. Fuxas is a medium uh, star who's trying to build this cloud at the EUI in the last 10 years. And we don't know if he will ever make it, but he's supposed to. But then, then that's it. If you, if you scroll Casabella or Domus or whatever, <coughs> It's always the same thing. There's very little new art that's published. And when they publish, they generally not so interesting, because they could be dangerous if they're interesting. This is a church that Sandra Anselmi just built uh, in the outskirts. Of it is interesting, but most of the new buildings in Rome, they, they're done by the church. Because the church is the only one who can go through the bureaucracy and have the money to do things still. Uh, this, is the, this was the sixth. Uh, competition for the train station, and I was on the jury, but this is not important. But this is the one that's now under construction from an Italian young at that time firm by Paolo Desideri and others. Then another fact I registered, which is very interesting, I think, is this. Uh, a few months ago, it came out this book. It's an interesting book by an Italian journalist, and she tells all the story of this. Uh, Italian students which migrated with the Erasmus process and then never come back. Um, and everybody's very happy, no? you know, the Erasmus generation is so nice, we're in Europe, we go around. But the funny thing is a lot of these young Italians go away, but there's not of these German, English, uh, French or Spanish who move to Italy. So this looks much more like an immigration versus the uh, Erasmus generation. But the Erasmus generation is interesting because there's a lot of uh, Italian architects actually building and, and doing good, good design abroad. You know, everybody knows Elisabetta, but Elisabetta, uh, Elisabetta Ferragni did a very interesting project. He lives, she lives in New York now, she did this interesting project in Bolzano, Trento, which is the recycling of a tunnel, of a previous uh, a tunnel for, for uh, cars and, and trucks into a museum. Uh, everybody knows the work of Giuseppe Ada, a typical Erasmus uh, runaway from Italy who settled in New York and they're doing now very interesting work uh, all around the world. Uh, this is another interesting, another interesting thing is this mixing, you know, Italians who move abroad and create international firms with people from local space. This is the Lean Architects in Germany, so Julian comes from Rome and Phil Geipel from Berlin. And they did, this, for me, one of the best projects of the last years, which is the recycling of a submarine uh, garage in, 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 of course, in Bretagne, in France, the Ilo 17, which is a beautiful uh, kind of tour project in, in, in a, on a topic which I consider very, very important, which is the recycling of the existing buildings. Um, in London, there are many young Italian firms. This is called Ecological Studios, so they will even have uh, parametric evidence, let's say. Uh, so, I mean, it is the, the funny thing, so we have uh, Italian, uh, we have I Italian clients for international architects all around the world. We have international architects building in Italy, we have very little important architects building in Italy. We have Italian architects building abroad. We have young Italian architects building abroad. So the problem must not be architecture. Maybe the problem is architects. So they just do not want uh, Italian architects to build in Italy. So there must be a problem between us and our society. There must be a gap. We don't know how to fill it. So, uh, so, and then the other thing is we always find architecture as a flower in, in the 
in the leftover yard, you know, as a decoration, like the like the little building uh, by 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 Stephen O. So the the real title I wanted to give to the book, which they did not let me do, is a very uh, politically incorrect title. But it's a joke by Groucho Marx who says, "Should I have a garden? I will keep a girlfriend." You know? So I wanted to title the title I wanted to give to the book. Should I have a garden? I will keep a contemporary architecture. So. So the thing is, there are interesting buildings, there are a lot of interesting things happening, there are Italian architects who demonstrate that they can work as the others when they're not in the, when they're not in the precinct of the country. Uh, but then architecture do not really react and interact in society. It's not there to build the future of the society as it should be. Uh, so I, so the next step for me is and was to, to, to wonder why, to ask myself why, to understand which are the problems we are not able to solve and to go on. So the first problem is so easy I and mean, it's so final, we should, we should just stop the lecture here because it's numbers. Italy has 150,000 uh, licensed architects, which, which means a number you could uh, have if you put together Spanish architects, uh, uh, Great Britain architects, French architects, and German architects together, all together in a country which is very dense and tiny. Uh, the proportion in London, I think, is one architect each uh, 2,000 inhabitants. In Rome, is uh, uh, one architect each 200 inhabitants. <laughs> And each one of us has a couple of square kilometers to work in the country, <laughs> included lakes and rivers and mountains. Uh, I mean, I remember when, when I was 18, and I was, of course, super leftist, and, and uh, even left of the Communist Party will read Marx. And the first thing you learn from Marx is when, you know, the inoccupancy, when the Esercito Industriale di Reserva is too big, uh, the, 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 the worker has no contractuality, has no power. That's exactly what happens in Italy. Too many architects means no power to the architect. There's always somebody else ready to do your job for free, for instance. So, so this, I think this is the real point. The cynicism by uh, lawmakers, uh, school directors, uh, dean of the um, uh, professional organizations who increased this number with no sense of what they were doing, and with no sense of what effects, it would, what, what the, out, the outcome of this process would be on the people and on the landscape. Because the landscape is a disaster, but nobody ever put together the two information. Our landscape is completely consumed. Uh, we train the actors in this way. You, you just put the two things together, and you understand a lot. Uh, we have junior artists. It was funny because it was a big discussion because the undergraduates, uh, uh, they didn't want to be called junior, so they called them junior with I instead of J. <laughs> 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 so, and they have a professional association because, of course, in Italy we have the other problem, which is the high school degree, the geometry, I would build uh, 15 times what the artists build, or 50 times what the artists that, then we gave another final uh, colpo di grazia, how do you say that, the final shot to the, to the education when they, when they created a new degree which is called Ingegneria Architettura. So you study in the middle and when you graduate you can choose to go into the engineering association or in the architects association. So it's like training to go somebody to be in the middle between a theft and a cop. No? <laughs> <laughs> I can give you a third kind of call if, you, if you're not in an American movie. Yeah. And, I mean, 80,000 architecture students. Uh, the, the, the other terrible problem is competitions. We do so, a lot of competitions now in Italy. <coughs> I think that less than 5% of those who go to construction after a winning project is chosen all the bureaucratic things is done, there's money invested in the development of the project, and then it generally ends up in nothing. Uh, then there are cultural, there's not only, uh, there are cultural reasons. The first reason 
What is Italian architecture? I mean, I, 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 I wish maybe you would forgive me for some uh, schematization I'm going to do today. Italian architecture, contemporary architecture, is, is basically about two issues. The one issue is the city. An, a, an architect which is being trained, which grows up in Italy, is not even able to think of a building without thinking of the relation of that building with its urban context or with its context. We just grow up with that approach. And the other issue, which is typical of Italian architecture, is the capability, the ability of uh, interject history without eventually making it become a Thomas Gordon Smith, whatever project, a postmodern project. Uh, but these two things, they both went into a cri critical condition in the last year. So we somehow felt our ground uh, disappear. No? So the disappearance of the city means that in, in a discrete number of years, in a certain number of years, we passed from, I mean, till the, the end of the Aldorossi generation, we all had in mind this. You know? We thought that everything we designed had to be confronted with this culture, with this knowledge, this heritage, and this legacy. But this is what we work on today. So today, the city, this sprawl condition which invades the whole landscape, uh, forces us into the idea of building as an object, which is completely away from our history, so we have to rebuild the discipline uh, about this. Uh, the, this thing has been, uh, let's say, presented to the world a number of times. One of the most interesting uh, ones was when Stefan Boyer and uh, Gabriele Basilico did an exhibition uh, in uh, the Biennale of 1996 about the new Italian landscape. And Gabriele went around the whole, divided Italy in sections and went around the whole Italy taking images of the new Italian landscape. Uh, and the, the things you could learn were a lot. We, we, we could learn that there, were, there was no difference between north, center, and south. Uh, and the typical, you know, the orderly north, the messy south doesn't work anymore. It's the same kind of disorder. There is no difference between legal Italy and illegal Italy, you know, because most of the consumption of landscape and cost lines nearly in the north has been done within the master plans, within a perfect uh, regulation uh, system. And the same effect you have in Sicily or in all the south where buildings get built before they, they get approved after through the complicated uh, bureaucracy I will not tell you about. Uh, so this is this is exactly this is more or less where, where we have to work in, which makes it very interesting. It is been very interesting for my generations, but 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 it, it is a new thing. It is very hard, and it is changing some of the paradigm of the work we have to do. Uh, and it's it's interesting because it, it Italy is it's made by ten big conurbations today. The, you know, the Milano, Venezia, the East Coast, the Liguria, uh, from Napoli to Roma, the, an incredible city which is growing around a bridge which do not, does not exist between the Calabria and the Sina. Uh, this is a typical, and this is also the source of most of the economic boom in, in the last uh, 30 years, because each of these houses were uh, agricultural houses and then became little business, little company, little industrial settlement. This is exactly where my, my, my school is in the old historic center of Ascoli there. And this is the valley that separates Ascoli from, from the sea. You can see the, the, the city now is made of uh, industrial boxes, single family houses, infrastructure, and lack of public space. You know, the four matters, I think. And sometimes the city becomes incredibly thin, you know? becomes uh, one, one house, one house, one house, and you have to spend infrastructure, uh, streets, everything to, to fill it. Um, I mean, that's, it is. that's another lecture. The other big problem is, is what we have, the relationship we have with politics, with, with people who make and take decisions in this country. 
uh, the Italian theater has always been incredibly tied. You know, the typical client for the important architect in Italy, this is for the students, because my friends know very well, the typical client is the state, the, 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 the municipality, the region. The, it's, it is not the private client. Italian theater has been developed by public commissions, uh, even complicated ones, like the one Terrani developed for the Casa del Fascio in, in Como. Uh, in different stages with different uh, relations, but this has been very important for the whole 20th century, you know, from this to, to De Carlo discussing with the students who were ready to occupy the Triennale in 1968, so an incredible presence of the architects in the revolutionary time of the end of the 60s, or the in incredible housing intervention did by, made by the uh, Rossi, Aimonino, Maria Fiorentino, uh, this is Aimonino Rossi in Milano, or the terribly, terribly zen by the Terrible Gott in Palermo, which were exactly a political project. No? They were trying to build a new society which was not exactly shared by the, by the society itself, by the people themselves. Uh, this, is a, this is interesting because this is a, a TV journalist going to uh, Gregotti's uh, office and asking, so would you still do the, the Zen project today? He said, oh yes, she said, he said, the Zen is beautiful, he said. And then this is, and then that, that's the manifestation, the typical uh, phenomenon of how society and the architecture world do not speak to each other in a clear way in, in, our, in our country. Uh, I think there was a little, uh, there was a last moment of hope. Oh, I, I, I did this discussion with, because we were invited to do a seminar on the 90s, no? because we are studying now what, what happened in the 90s. And I think the time of the first Prodi government, this was 1996, 1994, 1996, till 1998, uh, you can read an incredible parallelism between the attempt uh, some people was doing, from Bernardo Secchi down to Boeri, to, to Mirko, to us, to uh, turn the Italian uh, neo-rationalist traditional architecture into something ready to be up to date to the world and to the time and to the new century, in the same time in which I think the Prodi coalition was trying to turn the Italian uh, Marxist and communist and socialist tradition into a democratic party to be you know, a possible ruling class for the future. We both failed, that's the problem. No? And the, the disaster of the Italian politics today is exactly mirroring the disaster of, uh, of the Italian architecture. Thing. But it's interesting to to see how these two things got together, got close, got interacting. And the Maxi is actually the only mm, tangible uh, outcome of this process, because when Prodi became uh, prime minister and he called his young minister of la cultura, Veltroni, and Veltroni came to us and said, well, I want to speak about contemporary architecture and contemporary art. Uh, let's go the people, and we did meeting, and we tried to write a law about the enforcement, enhancement of contemporary architecture and quality in architecture. And they founded this institution, which was called DAR, the Direction and Agency, when, like Mark has experienced that. They founded what there was not before, an agency for the promotion of contemporary art and architecture, which was called DARC at the time. And from the DARC came the competition for the Maxi, and then the Maxi was built as a long wave of that process. But it, this was, I think, the only, uh, the last moment of optimism, both for architecture and, 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 and contemporary culture and politics in the uh, this is actually Caldrava again. Uh, this is the mayor of Reggio Emilia when they opening the, the bridge. And the throne with footsteps uh, opening the, 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 the construction side of the new uh, world. 
the, the, the wind changed after, no? it, the, it's interesting that when uh, after a long span of time with this uh, left wing and progressive democratic males in Rome, the right wing uh, pushed by Berlusconi won again the elections and the first thing Alemanno, the new mayor of Rome said when he was uh, made mayor was that he wanted to demolish the Arab Archies by Richard Meyer. <laughs> so, and, and it was funny because the, the Arab Archies by Richard Meyer, which is not an incredible building, but it is a building, is the third most visited museum in Rome. That's very interesting. And in the old Arab Archies, which some of you, of course, remember, nobody would go. You know, in, 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 uh, and, but this is not. This is, it's more cultural than political because in the same days the new mayor of Bologna, Cofferati, which came from the Democratic Party, immediately demolished this little building <coughs> made by uh, Mario Cuscinella, which was in the center of Bologna because it was too close to the historic uh, monuments. No? So they, they, they both, then Alemanno, of course, was able to demolish the Arabashis in Bologna. It was much easier, it was a small project. So we, we, so we lost uh, we lost the ability of discussing with, with politics, I think. Or at least everything got more complicated and we're trying to update it. Uh, there, there are also social reasons why we have problems to find our way in our society. Uh, architecture in Italy for 30 years has been building an utopia, no? has been trying to build an utopia. This is a, the most, the only beautiful project by Grigotti, I think, in his life, which is this five kilometers building which owes the university in, in, in Cosenza. And the building is, this is, the project is from 1972. Uh, the first block was open. I think at the end of the 80s, and the building is un still under construction. And it's a great thing because every, every time they need more space, they go on building this, this inf infinite bar. And I think it's, it's much more impressive than the Super Studio uh, visions, you know, because it's incredibly true, you know? it's real, and it is there. But it is, of course, utopia at the same time. I would, you could not think of a word made by building which are kilometers long. Uh, but a, a, again, now we have these two, we've been dealing with two versions of utopia in Italy, in the architecture in Italy. Which the one was more integrated, the, inter, the intellectual organic, you know, the organic intellectual, the organic not in the sense of the American food today, but the integrated intellectual in, in parties and, pro, and projects, and then the hippie version of it, you know, the, so Tafuri would stand with Rossi and Monino and Gregotti versus the super studio and the ra radicals who were considered like, uh, you know, spoiled kids in, in good Florence families, no? Hippies. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's true. It's true. Uh, but this utopia never really worked. I mean, it worked to create some masterpiece. But then, you know, the first day that the Gallera Tese in Milano, the, the building by the, the neighborhood by Alcano and Molino and Rossi opened, there was an incredible battle because it was, of course, uh, public housing and it was assigned to a number of families. But all of the families who were back in the, in the graduatoria, we say, back in the lease, they would go there and occupy the houses before the others. And this was the symbol of an incredible conflictuality that this would lead to, like the 50, like the 5,000 uh, families living in the Corviale, no? and considering this a sort of a hell, uh, urban hell. Uh, and there are symbols, I think, of this crashed utopia. There are symbols that are very clear, and they're very interesting. And in fact, I'm pushing a student of mine who's doing a, um, PhD research on our lovely bones, no? on our uh, lovely ruins, which is an incredible number of buildings designed by maestros, uh, which have been built, completed, and never used. I mean, this, this gives you an incredible sense. This is the theater in, 
Shaka by Albert, uh, Giuseppe Samona, Alberto Samona. This building was presented in Casabella as a completed and open building in 1986. I don't remember exactly when. 1984. No, it was still yeah, it was going to 1986, but it, it was never open. It stays and it's been staying as a ruin in Shaka now for 25 years, yeah, and they don't know what to do with it. Um, this is my master, my mentor and master, Ludovico Guaroni Church in Gibellina, built after the earthquake in 1970, um, staying in ruined condition for uh, 25 years again now. Uh, the mythical Casa del Studente by Giorgio Grassi, which is still like this, uh, built in, in, the, in the late 70s. Um, Viganò, a great architect from Milano, a beautiful high school project, a kind of utopian high school project, which is like that today. Uh, a super condition, which is the Francesco Venezia Museum uh, for Gibellina, which is actually a frame to put ruins, which is now in ruin himself, no? itself. So it's a super complicated frame. Vittorio Gregotti. Uh, a non-unforgettable project by Vittorio Gregotti in Forlì, which, is, uh, which was never used. Uh, an adolescent skeleton in, uh, in the outskirts of Milano. This was supposed to be uh, a train station. Uh, Giorgio De Carlo, the, the summer vacations, uh, the Colonna, Colonia Estiva. This has been used actually for a while, but now it is like that for, for 10 years at least. Uh, on, on the East Coast. This incredibly beautiful project by uh, Luigi Pellegrini, a sort of pre colas uh, project from the early 70s, which is, which is being half used and half abandoned for 40 years now. Glauco um, Gretzleri, one of these Super Le Corbusian brothers uh, in Bologna, this was another very beautiful project for our school and, and, and college near Bologna, which stayed like that for uh, uh, a long time. So this crash we had, this different, I mean, the, the architects building a world which was not supposed to take place. And the people trying to build a completely different world in the society created a huge crash and a huge conflict. So that's why, you know, the, they, they like to be, they, they believe in Zahadid when she wants to do uh, an uncanny, provocative project but they do not believe if I go there or whatever else, whoever else in the, in, in the country go there and proposes the same project. Pierre um, Vittorio is coming. I think Vittorio is trying to restore uh, a presence of ideology and, and autonomy in architecture, which I think is one of the causes of this problem. So it would be uh, I think interesting to listen to uh, how he argues and how he demonstrate this, but that's an interesting subject. Anyway, the relationship, as you understood, the relationship between politics and, and professional and cultural approach of architecture in Italy is one of the most important issues. <coughs> Architainment Architain uh, versus criticism. The other thing, of course, we were famous for was our, uh, our school of histories and our, our critical tradition. Uh, which is not there anymore. I mean, it, it, it is very interesting because if you open architecture today in Italy, it's incredibly fashionable. If you open whatever uh, newspaper, general magazine, you know, the, the one that comes with the, with the daily newspaper, every day there is a, an architect, there are interviews, there are one image of one far building with a rendering somewhere. Uh, and if you want to be informed, if you want to be up to date, you just have to look at them, and not to architecture magazine anymore. But at the same time, there's no, uh, no criticism there. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the enormous influence that the historians do have in Italy, uh, and they meant to erase any possibility of criticism in Italy, uh, means that the society has no, that the normal client has no intermediation with what the artists do and say. So I can choose a film by reading 
uh, reviews on this paper. I can choose I can choose a chair by reading reviews on industrial design in this paper. I can choose whatever. I cannot be held in architecture. Architecture and newspaper goes in the local chronicle area where you have the fight between the mayor who wants to demolish a building and the other ones who want to keep it or, or the other way around. Uh, uh, architecture goes in interviews. Architecture do not go on cultural pages. Not because it doesn't have the dignity. It is because the, the, the mm, editors do not trust uh, writers because they have too much influence by academic and professional and cultural uh, reasons. So, whatever, you will not find uh, criticism in Italy, and, and we know that our God and Father, Manfredo Tafuri, uh, he, for the first time, he said it clearly to an American uh, magazine, which was the design book review uh, edited at that time by Richard Ingers. So in this interview, he said that there is no criticism in architecture. There is only history, which was OK when architecture was an encoded language. So architecture was, in the 60s, you know, at the time of Rossi and, and these people, architecture was an encoded language which needed uh, people to decode them and to transfer it into directly to the ruling class. So the mayor of Pesaro would uh, call Carlo Emonino to design the master plan for Pesaro because Carlo Emonino was the accredited architect by Tafuri and by this very clear uh, word of criticism and, and ideological criticism. Architecture today is completely different, you know? Uh, our superstars, they don't want critics, they want to speak to the audience, they want to seduce the audience, they want to speak directly to the people. Uh, we not be trained like that, and, and, and the lack of a different language uh, from the historical one uh, is another big loss, I think, for our country. A loss which is more painful if you think of what this tradition was before, at the time of the Bontempelli, uh, Bardi, Savinia, all people who were not architects were able to discuss, interact, and present architecture to the world. Uh, and this is also funny because Italy has about 100 architectural magazines. Of course, because you have 150,000 possible clients. Uh, and some of them, you know, Domus and Casabella have been here for uh, 80 years now, 82 years now, 83 years now. Abitare has been there forever. I mean, some of the most important magazines in the, or traditionally most important magazines in the architecture world, they basically have no influence today on what happens in terms of uh, built architecture and the discourse in architecture. Another thing which have, we have been deprived deliberately of is the relationship with art, which is also new, no? because if you think of the futurists, if you think of the, uh, the clinical time, you think of all the uh, 20th century tradition, there was a very strong uh, dialogue between artists and architects. This was completely erased by the um, by the ideological and political approach to architecture of the 50s and 60s. But from, from again on, uh, the reading of architecture, architecture was infrastructure for the world. So it could not be decoration for the world, as art is. So the only excursions we made in the world of art for years and decades have been the drawings by Adorossi, or Scolari, or Cantatora, and, and then this beautiful work by our photographers, who were the only one to react positively to this, Basilico, Barbieri, Ghirli, a lot of this. Um, now we're trying to, uh, to restore this, especially through the work of Arte Pubblica. No? This is a collaboration I had with two artists to build this little thing, very little. Nine, it's a nine square meter thing. It took five years for us to to go from the idea to the construction near, near Bologna. Uh, but art is a denial. You know? If you still read Gregorio or Pulini, they would tell you uh, architecture is dying because it's getting closer to art. 
is interesting. Uh, so this is, this is the picture, which is quite pessimistic, I must say, but we're here, we're here to fight. But the, the next, which would be the next responsibility to somebody who wants to, to look at this, at this story or to react or to understand it, I think is to try again to build relationship with what happens at home and what happens in the world. You know? So maybe the one interesting thing is that if, uh, if architecture usually has been suffering this kind of crisis for a long time, uh, there is probably a different moment for architecture in the world too. No? We're kind of getting off a sort of a super party uh, of architecture, a super uh, festivity which has been going on since the 80s, since probably, uh, since somebody would say since the deconstructivist show in, in the MoMA, but probably I think since the James Stirling projects for the museum in the, in the 70s. The architecture has been growing and growing and growing and building more, building more expensively, more aggressively, more audaciously in terms of engineering in the last 30, 40, 30 years. And it is now probably a moment of what, what am I? What can I do? How can we face the crisis? But not anymore, especially in the Western country, because the East is as a different paradigm. And maybe the paradigm that has been uh, shaping the approach to architecture, to research, innovation, and technology in architecture in the last uh, 30 years is generally in crisis. So maybe one possibility we have is to confront our problems with the problems in the world and find if we can have uh, discussions, solutions, exchanges which will be of any use to everybody. So what's architecture about today? Uh, architecture today is again about art. I mean, the fact we understood that the world uh, built itself so fastly, so quickly, that we can't even sometimes catch with what's happening in the, in, the, in, the, the, in, the, in the city next to us, in the suburb of our city, or in Dubai, or whatever in the world, uh, push architecture towards the art uh, paradigm, which is uh, critical, which is provocative, rather than uh, infrastructure. Architecture today is about social engagement. No, this is this was put here before. But it's interesting to most of us are interested today in what's happening in terms of how architecture can start to interact again with the needs, the problems, and the conflicts that the, that society has in, in an infinite uh, landscape of problems. Uh, so architecture is about art, architecture is about social engagement. Architecture is about a new uh, sense of ecological uh, consciousness. No? We, we all want to be sustained, we all want to be organic, I'm sure. We all want to be sustainable. We do not to rely only on technology because we do not, we never know. Some technology works, does not work, it's very expensive. But we never see the results, we never see the outcomes, we never have the real data. So we want to develop our approach to sustainability, which is now based on your technology. We want to different approaches to design, which can build a different system of needs. So the high end is a perfect sample for that. Architecture today is about program. I think that the transformer by Rem Kulas in, in, in Seoul is the perfect representation of this. There is a neo-functionalist sensibility, which I think is one of the most interesting uh, item we can find the architecture world today. Also a very clear uh, discourse you can have when you think of a building and you think how our, build, our building can be received and used in society. Architecture today, of course, is about technology, no? it's about robots, it's about uh, science. Uh, how, how can we fit in this? Do, do we have the possibility to start uh, and push again our architecture by con confronting our condition and our tradition with this new paradigm which we can be dealing with. Uh, well, it can be. Italy has a very uh, strong tradition in terms of collective housing. In this last, uh, in this last 30, 40 years, we've been seeing that the world uh, has been built through single family housing. In Italy, 
which was completely out before. Italy is made of single family housing. Now we understood that single family housing means uh, uh, consumption, uh, uh, excessive consumption of resources, excessive consumption of land, excessive consumption of money to uh, infrastructure the whole country. So we will have to rethink about the possibility of collective housing, maybe on different bases, not on the basis of uh, Cordiale and Galatese, but may maybe on the basis of new idea of communities, maybe on the basis of the co-housing project, which I think are very interesting. And this is, I think, is an Italian co-housing project. But I think that the tradition we have in investigating the, the topic of collective housing can be an interesting uh, thing today. I think that architects in Italy have not touched anymore after the trauma, I think. You know, after the, the end of the 70s, we didn't dare, uh, we even didn't dare uh, investigating the problem of housing and designing housing. We left the people design their own house, but it is now. A lot of places in the world have enormous uh, volumes. Uh, they don't know what to do. It would be uh, crazy sometimes or more expensive to demolish them and do something new. They can be here, they can be memory, but they can become something else. I think this is, of course, very much into our history. You know? My, uh, I live in a building which has been transformed since the uh, 13th century. Right? Uh, so we are used to that, but now we want to be used to that with a different sensibility. A sensibility which is able to create a new aesthetics by this, I think, basically. Uh, we, want to, uh, we want to be social sensible. These are the women who go play cards in the, in the little pavilion we did. We want to investigate, uh, how do you say, participation, no? participation. Uh, the camera was a king of this and it created a lot of problems. Well, maybe this heritage, this legacy can become again interesting now, so participation can be another issue. And then uh, public space. Now what, what, misses in, uh, what misses in the, in the contemporary distribution of you know, power, money, and intentions is, is most of the times is the possibility to create and, and, and build public space, which is exactly where the identity of a democratic condition is built. No? People meet in public space uh, versus the individual condition we all have to face today. So the, 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 the main task we did when we made, with a lot of help by Barry, we did, made, we made big efforts to get together in this project for the PS1 uh, and, and Maxi together to build a summer uh, installation which would host parties, uh, lectures, events of any kind. And then we finally selected the group which for us was interpreting very well this need of additional public space. In this case, I think it's, it's, a, it's a simple landscape project which will annoy a lot of Zan, I'm sure. Uh, but it's interesting, but it has some little ideas, no? that the space can be puzzled and re-put together with all these islands and come back to a single big island, or they can be distributed around. It's all made of recycled materials. The materials will be recycled after the, the installation, just like the uh, Interpol project request in, in, in New York. So I think this is, a, this is a good start. And for me, it is also important for the role that the, the museum is working in now, but whoever else will be there, the museum has an important role because it's the first time you have an institution which has not to uh, pay excessive regard to any other ones. Now we don't have to respect academics' uh, power more than needed, we don't have to uh, yield to publisher power editorial power more than we, I mean, we are a strong institution, we want to be a table to confront all this problem, and we want to be an engine to try to push the situation, and to also, the idea of starting with a, a project for very young architects, for us was very important, and was supposed to be a symbol of the approach we want to be. Uh, this is it, this is the final index. In my book, I started thinking that this would be very different from my book, but in the end, I went back and most of the things 
uh, I've been trying to write is what I do can do to my class. Consequentiality of culture, then it felt like a uh, risk, and, 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 and walls are closed again. Yeah, and it seems so fearful. Yeah. Or, you know, there's some sort of fear at work, I'm not sure what, but, or either yeah. just a reaction that there's no oxygen left to breathe because it's too dense. I don't know if there was a, you know, like we need oxygen, and like design has limits, right? If it gets too dense, even the trees will die. Right? Well, if you want so to. There's like a, a level of organicness where design will die too. If yeah, but the, uh, a good metaphor, a good image for that is that, you know, it's the life of Italian students. They who, who graduate, who, some of them are good, some of them are not. They all find jobs with practically feeless, and they, they, do not, they cannot move from their parents' house. They still live within their parents' house when they're 35. And then the claustrophobia becomes a social problem. Exactly. So, yeah. <laughs> And we are in the G7, now that's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> it, it was very interesting. Um, thank you so much for your talk. And uh, it's good to see this uh, elaborated. And in, in looking at the images that you showed, there's it, it both kind of the obvious valorization of uh, architects of a certain tier, but there's also the recognition of the kind of terrain vague, which is the reality worldwide of American cities and the reinforcement of a kind of new critique of cities. Um, I often think about our largest export as a kind of media culture and also the suburb. So in terms of the, both the kind of critique from the Italian standpoint yeah. and also the approach to the suburb or remaking the kind of reality of the periphery, uh, which you see in kind of Fellini, what, what, what is the thinking in Italy about new approaches there? I was, I was asked by the Trecani. Trecani is the traditional Italian encyclopedia. They, were, they, they did a huge volume on the 21st century. And so one of these volumes was dedicated to the city and they told me what we want to write. And I wrote something which was, was called La Fine della Periferia, the end of periphery. Because in Italy now, I think it is impossible to distinguish suburban from urban and suburban from rural. It's a continuous hybrid, uh, of course, with, and then, then you get into a 16th century piazza, and you understand you are in the historic center. But there is no edge, there is no clear limit. Which, is, on, on one side, it is interesting, because, for instance, we've been obsessed uh, you know, the, the democratic planning was obsessed by this difference of values between the center and the suburban. So a city, a house in Piazza di Spagna, of course, has no value, but a house near Piazza di Spagna costs 20,000 euros per square meters, 
and a high and a house in the suburbs cost 1,000, 2,000 euros per square meter. In, in all medium Italian cities, this is over. In Ancona, if you buy a house which is lost in the suburb, close to the highway, close to the shopping mall, uh, close to other infrastructure, has exactly the same price that a house in the center near the Piazza del Papa or whatever, 16th century value. So some of the houses are interesting because they destroyed some of the evils we see. But on the other hand, and this, this thing, you don't really know what holds this together. Uh, the, the figure for me, the, the image for me is the individual city. Because everyone, because a dif the difference with America is America is incredibly wide. Italy is so small, so this happens in an incredibly dense way. Everything is on top of the other, everything is very close, you can touch, you can build your shoes in your in your cellar and sell them to the Lavalle who puts the top sample and sell them but at the same time you, you have your kitchen garden. I mean urban landscape urban mean, has been there forever in Italy, no? Uh, uh, but then everybody has his own city. I live here, I shop there, I go to the movie there, I go to the beach there, I go to uh inhalate some historic identity there and every everyone has his own. And that's interesting. So you can have a menu city, a city a la carte. It's a, and that's interesting. But that's destroying, of course, the, the urban culture. And so, but now maybe the crisis will help this because cities do not will not grow anymore in this way because there's no money and there's no more, more landed. But it, it has completely changed the paradigm of city. <coughs> I'm sorry, my voice is not at its standards. Um, it seems that this kind of condition of uh, historicism and the importance of culture and tradition in Italy is, you know, a driver for this kind of claustrophobia for the designer and the architect. And do you think that that arises from the fact that of the way we used to build was so that things would last for thousands of years, and so you know they're still around. And uh, what do you think about the way that we build now, where buildings, you know, they'll disappear much more quickly. They're not made to last in the same way. And how do you think that that condition will kind of change the way that it's going? Uh, it, th this is very important. I think we have been, in, in, in the Italian, uh, there was a moment, a very risky moment in the 50s, after the war. Everybody was excited, the economy was growing incredibly quick. And we risk we will lose all of our legacy. No? The developers could buy a piece of a Centro Storico and build their palazzinas and nobody would react because we needed to make money, to create money, to create a uh, geo uh, At that moment, the architects got scared and say, this is forever. What we do is not forever. Let's distinguish, let's be attentive which was good, of course. You know, Rogers, Casabella in the 50s were teaching this, was teaching this. But uh, then, and there's a lot of discussion about this in historians, Barnum accusing us on one side, somebody else. But that helped in creating a society, in the Italian society, only for architecture, there is this conviction that all this good and good is bad. And that's still there. So you can have super buildings as beautiful little things here and there, but uh, good modern, I mean, what is the quantity of good quality, which is the important thing, is not there. Uh, architects still, till a few years ago in Italy, have been convinced they were building forever, that the building they would build should stay there forever. Uh, now, this is changing, but it's changing now. It's a completely new, maybe Renzo Piano helped this, because if you tell to Renzo Piano you want to demolish this building, he's happy, because he says, yeah, let me do another one. <laughs> and, and issue a new invoice, and he's very happy. But well, it's okay, I think it's good. But this distinction between hardware and software of, of built environment 
with the consciousness we are trying to be now, but it's completely new. And this has been one of the problems, I think, in the, in the, in the last two days. I don't know if I answer. I think we'll save your voice and then we'll announce the reception. Grazie.